Hello, and welcome to the Improving Always podcast. This week, we are talking about recovery. Um, so, you know, what you should be doing outside of your training to make sure that you can train even harder and uh, what you should not be wasting your time with. Um, and we're actually going to start with uh, things that you should not be wasting your time with, and then we'll get into stuff that you should be doing for recovery. Um, so obviously on, you know, we're all on social media I'm pretty active on social media and probably 90 plus percent of the things that I see about recovery, um, while I'm watching the video or reading the post or whatever, I'm just shaking my head the whole time. Uh, obviously there, there are some people who put out some really, really good stuff, um, about recovery, but even, you know, I see some fairly intelligent people that I would expect, uh, expect more of, um, putting out stuff about, um, you know, ice baths and stretching and foam rolling and, you know, all, all this stuff that there's really not that much evidence behind it. So, like I said, we're going to start with what is not recovery. Um, and then we'll get into the things that you should be doing. Um, so we'll, we'll go through, uh, a bunch of, a bunch of different things. Um, anyone have a preference of where we, uh, what we, what we start with, what, what popular, uh, recovery. I would say, let's start with the worst of the worst and the worst of the worst are going to be things that actually not only don't work, but one cost you a lot of money and also potentially could even cause some negative side effects. So I'm going to go into some of the more crazy stuff, such as the cupping therapy and stuff like that. Um, cupping therapy, if you don't know what it is, it's where they put the cups on your back and it, they're basically suction cups and they suck little bubbles on your back and it causes these bruises. It's supposed to increase blood flow and all this thing, but it's actually just giving you hickeys. So when you see these like little circles on people's back, they're just artificial hickeys and it's not doing anything for recovery and it just costs money. You have to go somewhere and there's actually at least a small chance of skin infections from it. So like not only does it cost you money, it doesn't work. There's a small chance that you could have a skin infection infection. So it would even cause worse recovery. Yeah, uh, definitely. And you know, one thing that I find interesting with, um, with a lot of these things, but, uh, kind of, especially with cupping, um, is that, um, I think it was the 2008 Olympic games when all the athletes were having Michael cupping Phelps done. in particular, was that, I guess, I guess that was probably cause it was in, in Beijing maybe. Oh, it was Just, Michael Phelps. Yeah. It was because Michael Phelps did it. Yeah. And everyone's like, he's the greatest Olympian of all time. So we must copy <laughs> the greatest Olympian of all time. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy because, you know, that that's what I'm saying about like people who should, should know better. Like Michael Phelps has a whole team uh, of people, you know, whose job it is to make sure he's, you know, at the, at the, at the top level that he can be at. Um, and he's doing things like that, obviously not a waste of money for him because he can yeah. toss around money for whatever, but, um, but even then, you know, it, like there, there's literally, there's not even like a mechanism by which this would help. Like I'm, I'm confused yeah. about like, like some things you can think like, Oh, you know, like ice baths. I know we're going to get to this. And like, Stretching, yes, foam rolling. Yeah. But like, at least like I can see an idea behind it. Like if, if there were no studies on it and you just didn't know at all, like maybe someone would think the theoretically an ice bath is there, like reduces inflammation, which you would think, oh, that's a good, like just hearing that you're like, oh, that's a good thing. But I start with cupping. I struggle to like, what, what are you, what are you doing? What are you trying it, to do with it? <laughs> it really comes down to the appeal to antiquity because the whole thing is, is that it's traditional Chinese medicine and it's been mm -hmm. done for thousands and thousands of years. And if it's done for thousands and thousands of years, of course it must work. I mean, it's not like we haven't learned from the past. I mean, I don't know about that. I mean, but that gets into other things. Um, these are slightly less common, but like acupuncture is another one that some people do and same same type of thing um i've actually read a study that showed that 
placebo actually got better results than acupuncture. And same thing with scraping, which are, those are the three oh, yeah, big they're... Chinese traditional medicine things that the baseball player on the TikTok that I made videos oh, yeah. responding to. Um, I, one other one, um, chiropractic medicine. If, do you guys know the history of chiropractic medicine? Uh, that it's, I mean, I'm going to look, I'm going to look up the name <laughs> of the founder real quick because I, I want, I want you guys to know who he is because it's, it's rather important and really will make everyone think very. So the founder of chiropractic medicine was a man named Daniel David Palmer. Um, and he was a magnet healer before he invented chiropractic. And now when you find out that he was a magnet healer, your opinion of him just skyrockets to the top, of course, right? Yeah. <laughs> but then he invented chiropractic and he thought that we got energy from the sun and that subli subluxations in our spine were preventing us from getting this proper en energy from the sun. So we must do the back cracking to realign our spine and that could cure all illness. And that's a big red flag there all illnesses but a lot of athletes think that they need to have their spine cracked because their back is sore or whatever like that and i mean professional athletes do this i've even heard of some professional teams having team chiropractics which is really kind of funky yeah that's a major red flag yeah it's crazy because like you know anyone who says they can realign your spine you would like what what uh with chiropractic medicine like says that they do you need surgery for that stuff. Yes. Like you can't, absolutely. you cannot, you cannot do it for without like, I actually, I follow this, this hilarious guy on Instagram who does um, cooking videos mm -hmm. and he, he does them kind of satirically, like making fun of, uh, you know, people who say they can like massage out like muscle, it <laughs> muscle adhesions and stuff. And he has like the chicken breasts and he's like massaging out the muscle, muscle adhesions with like, or like, pounding it with like a hammer to try to get the adhesions to go away. And they, you know, <laughs> like you cannot do that. Like it does, it does not work. Um, so anyone telling you that they're like massaging out muscle adhesions or like realigning your spine, like moving your, your bones around, like, what are you kidding me? Like that, that is not a good thing. Chiro like, um, and not only does it not help, but you know, there's, there's definitely cases where it, uh, it can, yeah, it's, it it's usually not too bad, but there's actually been a few cases. The most notable one I think of, there was a Playboy model that had that died because they did the neck cracking thing. And it like, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly the mechanism of what killed her, but when you do the neck cracking thing, like it actually can hurt you. And there's been multiple cases of people dying from it. So like, yeah, in, in the case of this, Neck cracking in particular is just something it's not even worth it if there's a 0 0.01 chance of dying because it's not going to help you, but it could kill you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And zero, 0 0.01 is probably less than that, to be fair. That's not a horror. What is that? One in 10,000? Yeah. That's not, that's not like horrible odds. It's probably closer to like one in a million, but you know, either way. But still, uh, it's just. <laughs> It's, it's, it's no one point. millionth of a chance that yeah. I don't need to risk taking. 100%. Um, so those, yeah, those are some of the more extreme ones. And then we get into stuff like uh, stretching. Uh, well, actually, yeah, stretching, foam rolling. Um, yeah, these are all the same stuff category. like that. Yeah, which is like, um, you know, it's obviously foam rolling is a lot less expensive than having some, you know, uh, like having chiropractic work done or yeah, and you could even do that with yeah. a soccer ball without a foam roller you don't <laughs> yeah, even... yeah. or tennis ball. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and stretching, obviously you don't need anything to, to be able to stretch. Um, uh, but like ice baths at, can cost a little money. Yeah. Ice baths, ice baths definitely can. I remember I played a uh, division one college soccer for a very brief period of time. Um, when I was 18 and uh, before I went, went back over to, uh, to Greece and then England. Um, but I, uh, <laughs> they made us take ice baths 
uh, after a lot of them still do sessions. Yeah. Um, which is, I mean, I get like, you know, it's, it's crazy because a lot of, a lot of people think that like, oh, you know, whatever the, whatever Michael Phelps is doing or whatever, like good teams are doing, that means that there's evidence. A lot of these teams do not follow, you know, evidence-based, uh, based approaches. There are some that do, uh, but, and I see it especially, like, I think even more so in a sport like soccer because it's uh, like a traditional sport. Some of the sports that are less traditional have um, like less of a, less of like a history of doing certain things. So they're quicker to like break these trends when they realize it's completely. Also America's slightly ahead of the curve in some ways. I mean, especially, I mean, we have the best sports scientists in the world and, they're getting applied to more American sports. Now the MLS does get them too. And so is the U S yeah. national team. It's just that like at the moment, the U S national team and MLS don't have that worldly influence yet. It's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. It'll, it'll happen. But like, yeah, obviously <laughs> if like most of the research comes out of the United States, then you would assume that people are more like informed on that stuff. Um, but yeah. And there are, there are definitely clubs, um, in, in other countries that, that do really, really well, uh, and follow an evidence-based approach. But there are also, there are also like so many clubs, like just because like, I wouldn't be, I'm sure like all the best clubs in the premier league have like an ice bath place Mm -hmm. for their athletes to use, despite the fact that it's, there's no point. SK, you did some research on this. Do you have anything to say? Well, ice baths. Um, yeah, I mean, Basically, ice baths is supposed to reduce inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. But even it hasn't been proven to reduce inflammation. But even if it does, it could have some negative side effects for like athletes that want to gain strength and muscle hypertrophy. But one other thing I wanted to cover was that you mentioned a little bit is that people see these athletes do like we mentioned the last, last podcast, like Ronaldo do like a thousand sit-ups. And I heard like uh son does son, his dad made son do like mm-hmm. four hours of keep ups or something like that. And as soon <laughs> and, as we see and these beat athletes, him, if he didn't, yeah, as soon as we see, we see these athletes do something, we automatically go to the point yeah. that it's the most efficient thing you can do for yourself, which I think is a, is a huge misleading factor. And even in things that are proven, like, strength training just because you see an athlete do a strength exercise with like a bosu ball or something doesn't mean that you should incorporate mm-hmm. it in your workout yeah there's a big correlation versus causation thing that we need to understand just because it's correlated that you see a lot of people do something doesn't mean that's actually the product of it yeah. but with with the ice baths i mean yeah the big thing that i've noticed with the evidence is the only thing that it seems to really, really help for is temporary pain relief. So let's say you're an old man like me and your body just feels beaten to crap after playing a game. How old are you? 33. (laughs) Don't say you're an old man. I'm 27. I can't, I can't be hearing that. (laughs) I'm the old man of the podcast though. (laughs) True. True. But, but the, but the, Ice bath will provide me temporary pain relief. Now, the problem is, is like SK said, it can impede hypertrophy and other things like that, which will have a negative impact on athletic performance over time if you do it too often. But I personally don't because ice baths suck. And I'd (laughs) rather just not have an ice bath. I'd rather be in a little bit of pain in nice room temperature settings. I mean, even with like stretching and cupping or like uh chiropractic stuff some people could argue that it kind of feels good so that's why they do it but with mm-hmm. like ice bath you're in pain for like 10 minutes i don't get why would anyone want to do it yeah <laughs> well I, I, I think the pain is actually i think i think the pain's actually what they arguably like in many cases <laughs> i mean do you think cupping cupping definitely i mean can be a little painful but yeah, yeah i'm let's let's massage into, can be massage can be painful. massage can be brutal yeah, oh, I love like, massages. I'm not gonna lie. No, like I, I like massages too, but like deep tissue it, yeah. sports massage. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah like yeah, someone's like sure. you know kneading you with like their You're freaking sore like, elbows. You're you literally know, like, sore afterwards from it. Yeah, so like, maybe that's doing the opposite of recovery. And, and but, like 
if you have access to an ice bath, like it's a miserable experience, but like, let's say you play a game and you have a game later that same day or something, I could see an argument for like getting an ice bath so you can feel better for the next game. Yeah, temporary pain of, relief. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, it's not like there's never a use for any of those things. Some of some things like cupping, there's no use ever for it. Yeah. Um, unless you want to, I guess, if Have you think it looks cool, it looks cool or something. Way. Um, but like there, uh, for ice bath. So like there is a use, but like how common is that professional athletes or like in soccer, like what's the quickest turnaround from one game to another? Um, like Sunday to Tuesday. Sun- yeah, exactly. So like you have a full day in between to rest and you'll, you'll be, you'll benefit more from that. Um, I just want to tell uh, what, what were you going to bring up, Noble? Because I want to tell a little story to kind of when we uh, transition into what you should do. Um, I was going to get into more of the stretching and myofascial okay. release right. stuff let's, of foam rolling. <laughs> let's get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now here's the thing. The big difference between myofascial release, which is anything foam rolling related, basically, even I would include massage into this and stretching is in many cases, I do for recovery purposes, I do not find them harmful, which is a big difference between a lot of the other things where they actually can impede recovery and can actually be bad for you. So these things, while there isn't really any research showing that stretching helps recovery or that myofascial release helps recovery, if it feels good to you, I'm not going to tell you not to do it because it's not going to actually hurt your recovery. And even that placebo in your head could potentially help you. And if it does work through placebo, I'm not going to tell you not to do it unless it's actually harming you. So do you guys have anything you want to say about either of these? Because I have have at least one thing to say about myofascial release that we should talk about before we move on. Yeah, um, I I will say one thing. So I I don't know how much, how much we'll disagree, um, but it might be a little bit of a point of contention. I do not want, so I like, I'm on the same page with you. Like, I'm not going to tell someone like never get massages. It's like the worst thing you can do because it's not, uh, it won't be harmful, but I, if I'm going to give advice to a player, I do not want them benefiting from uh, the placebo effect for things like, you know, through things like massage, foam rolling, stretching, because the risk of relying too much on the placebo effect is that you end up noceboing yourself. So noceboing is basically like, let's say you get a massage every week and you think this helps me play better. Now, if you think that, maybe it does help you play a little bit better. And then one week you don't get your massage because the masseuse doesn't have time available for you. You don't have any money left to pay for it or, you know, whatever, whatever the case is, um, you don't get your massage. All right. Or you get to the, uh, get to the game a little bit late and you don't have time to foam roll before you get out on the pitch. And all of a sudden I didn't foam roll. I'm not going to play well. I didn't get my massage this week. Oh no, I'm going to have a horrible performance. If you think that you will have a horrible performance. So, and you know, you can say like, no, I'm never going to miss my massage. I'm never going to not have time to foam roll. It will happen. You know, you can't, uh, control like every aspect of everything. I don't want, so like if a player understands that a massage won't really help them play better, but they still want to get one. I used to get, uh, you know, yeah. sports massages, um, every week I knew it didn't help, but I, I got them for free. So I was like, why not? It feels good. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed them. So I used to do that. Um, but I didn't, I wasn't like placeboing myself into playing better. And I wasn't like noceboing myself. If I missed an appointment, um, I was, you know, I was chill. Uh, and I think it's important that athletes know that because if you start relying heavily on, on the placebo effect, there are negative consequences to that in, in my opinion. 
Yeah, I mean, it's basically like anything superstitious. If you have a superstition that if you don't put on your right shoe first and you realize you're putting your left shoe on first and then you have a bad game, it's because of that. Yeah. But I will say there is one thing. There's a very big difference between foam rolling before and after exercise um, and stretching before and after exercise. Interestingly, it's actually inverse. The foam yeah. rolling before exercise is the one where there might be some temporary acute benefits. So I'll actually get into what I was going to say about foam rolling and myofascial release. So what we have found evidence for with myofascial release is it can cause a acute increase in mobility. So for example, if you need a small increase in mobility before you start your workout or your play your game, foam rolling can work. However, I personally don't do it and I personally don't recommend it because warming up does the same thing. Yeah. It really isn't any better, but it does work. So if people think they need to do it for five minutes, I normally wouldn't tell them no. Yeah. However, what the claims that foam rolling does is that the myofascial release like by applying pressure to your muscles will help heal muscles and help heal connective tissues. This is based on some research on rats. And of course, humans are rats and we are Wait, anatomy foam, and physio foam rolling. Yeah. For my release. How, how, yeah, how, how, how did they, how did they, no, I'm, I, I'm getting, I'm getting into it, oh, because, I hear but, this. but human, human anatomy and physiology and rat, rats are yeah. exactly identical, right? There's yeah, no differences. True. Um, so what they did was is they took these little tools and the rats were, they had the rats drugged unconscious and they scraped them with the tools and they noticed that there was some regeneration of connective tissues. Now here's where the problem is. Those tools on rats would be the equivalent of us applying thousands upon thousands of pounds of force onto our bodies while we're doing foam rolling which just isn't practical. If you weigh 180 pounds and you're on a foam roller, you're applying 180 pounds. But with the tools on the rats, proportionately is closer to 2,000 pounds of force. Did they, ki did they kill any of the rats? No, no. Um, did it's they like break bones or anything? No, it's proportional force. Um, I don't know the exact forces that were going into the rats, but... If you did it for a human, you'd need a giant man with a giant tool doing it to yeah. the human to get the same effect. So we can't even do that to humans. It's just not practically possible. I mean, I guess you could try loading up a thousand pounds on a barbell and <laughs> rolling it across your body, but you need like just, weighted foam rollers that weigh like yeah, a thousand pounds. Yeah. So like the, the only evidence that supports it causing any actual like muscle recovery or regeneration of connective tissues is on these rats with these unrealistic parameters for what humans can do. And for that reason, it's just, it's not, you're just not going to be able to get benefit from it that way. And there's no reason to even think you could, nor is there any evidence that that same type of thing would actually work in humans because we can't test it. It's just not realistic or safe to test. Yeah. Do you know, um, this uh, has nothing to do with anything, but well, not really, but um, do you know how they do when they do like uh, resistance training studies on rats? Do you know how they, how they do that to like strength? How do you strength tra train a rat? I actually haven't looked into this, but I have read some studies on the hypertrophy of rats and it's interesting. I've always thought about it. I wanted to put my cats on a hypertrophy program. <laughs> SK, any idea? No. I'm lost. <laughs> they tie weights to rats' tails and make them climb ladders. <laughs> 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 it's so great. Uh, my, uh, we did a, in my undergrad, I had a, a class called Drugs in Sport um, or Drug Use in Sport, something like that. And it was, um, there, we went over some studies uh, on rats and, and steroids and stuff. Uh, and we watched a video of rats <laughs> with weights on their tail, just climbing ladders. And so it was hilarious. Um, so to segue us into what you should actually be doing on a tell little, I had a, Oh, I go had ahead. A question. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that. I had a question for no blitz. So I saw you make a TikTok about this where is like someone had an ankle injury and you said like putting slight pressure on it, either using your body weight or like, uh, 
some kind of resistance tool who would actually benefit and um, help you recover? I think, in the, in I think this was the reply to Sohel's knee tendonitis. Yeah, yeah it might have been. Um, it's um, So this is a bit different. This is more rehabilitation, um, but it's called graded exposure. So what graded exposure is, and the king in social media on that right now is knees over toes guy, because everyone thinks that with knee pain, you should avoid doing things that cause pain to your knee to where what most of modern physical therapy is. And also that's what his social media gimmick is, is that instead of avoiding things that cause you knee pain, we are going to slowly reintroduce stress to the joint until we can strengthen the muscles and tendons around the joint and the joint itself, of course, and build up a tolerance to doing that. And eventually this will make either the pain tolerable or even potentially go away. And I have some personal experience noticing that too, because I occasionally get knee tendonitis. But usually what happens is after I do some squats or lunges or something like that, my knee tendonitis tends to either become manageable or even completely go away. It's actually soccer that gives me knee tendonitis. Uh, yeah. Um, that, and that's actually perfect. Even, even better. You've set me up the perfect segue. Um, so I'll tell a little bit of a, a story. Um, so I tore my, uh, ACL in 2014. Um, uh, surgery was an absolute nightmare. Um, went to multiple doctors before I ended up getting my surgery. Um, I actually, I was, I was told I was fine <laughs> twice, uh, by different doctors, um, and then finally, uh, I, I ended up, um, getting, getting my surgery, uh, but it was super delayed. Um, you know, I recovered, started playing again and a couple months into playing again, I got horrible, uh, patellar tendonitis. Um, and it was, uh, honestly, sometimes more painful than when I actually tore my ACL. Um, so, I, you know, I, I basically, I hopped right in, I started playing like I was fine. Um, and I, you know, I was, uh, playing games every week, multiple games every week, uh, multiple training sessions every week, training on my own too. And I was just in extreme pain. Uh, and it got to the point where, uh, I was seeing a physical therapist. Uh, I would see him on a Monday after my, after my weekend game, um, I would see him on a Monday and then I would have, usually I would have a midweek game. Sometimes I wouldn't, uh, and on like Tuesday or Wednesday, and then I'd see him on Wednesday or Thursday. So I'd see him twice a week. Um, and, uh, basically I did nothing except play in the games. I had to sit out of so many training sessions because I was in extreme pain. Um, and, uh, what this guy would do is he would do stuff like massage, uh, acupuncture, um, Did all, you need acupuncture? yeah, uh, tons, <laughs> tons of different stuff. Uh, and this was back, you know, I was in my early twenties. I didn't, I didn't have a clue. Uh, and I would have done anything to just to be able to play and I was able to play. Um, and, uh, but I was every day after a game, I was in agony. Sometimes in games, I was in agony. I was able to get through, you know, 90 minutes if I, if I played the 90 minutes. Um, but in between games, it was horrible. Some days I could hardly walk. Um, and uh, I went through basically half a season like this. Um, and then I started working with someone new because I was like, you know, this is ridiculous. Like I can't do it. I can't even train. Um, or, you know, it was, it would probably been, you know, I'd probably go like two, three weeks without completing a full training session. I'd have to sit for part of it. Um, so I started seeing a new guy, started strength training, started doing, um, you know, I, I would train a little bit. I would be a little bit more smart about my training. Um, wouldn't try to do everything that I possibly could. Um, started taking care of myself a little bit better. Um, but definitely the huge thing was the, the strength training. Um, and spring season, I was able to play zero pain. Um, and now I'm not saying, well, zero pain next to next to no pain. Um, so, you know, 
I had made myself think, I had noceboed myself into thinking I needed this recovery, this acupuncture, massage, whatever, to be able to play um, when it, it just wasn't the case. Um, and that's, that's why I'm so hesitant to, um, or wh- why I'm going to, I'm going to tell young players straightforward, like, oh, when they message me and say, oh, I'm doing foam rolling. Is that good recovery? I'm be- no, it's not. It's not going to yeah. help you. Um, if I'm not going to say never foam roll. It's the stupidest that if you foam roll, you're, you're an idiot. It's going to hurt your um, gains. Yeah. But like, I, I will tell people straight up, like this stuff does not help you. Don't think that it does. If they ask me, because for me, um, this physical therapist, it was very harmful. Um, and a lot of people who tell, who preach this kind of recovery can be very, very harmful to young athletes. Uh, you know, harmful to their wallets, um, and harmful to them, you know, just, uh, like in, in general to their game. Um, and I'm so thankful I found this other physical therapist who is all about, you know, doing active recovery and, um, strength training, which is what we did. Um, you know, we would, I would do soccer training sessions with him. Uh, I would do strength training sessions with him. Um, and, And that was, that was basically it. It wouldn't, you know, waste time with like doing massages and stuff. You know, we worked together for an hour a week and and we did stuff that would actually work. And eventually I didn't even need to anymore. I could do it all on my own. Um, And uh, I have rarely had any flare ups from my patellar tendonitis since I started doing stuff like that. So if I, if I can add something right before we go in, uh, going back to what you said and what Noblet said, so couldn't that kind of be applied with foam rolling, like putting pressure on your sore areas of your muscles? Um, no, I don't think so. It's a completely different mechanism. Um, the stress that we're talking about, for example, with knee tendonitis that you need to expose yourself is like stress under load. And that would be like squatting or doing a lunge or something or the loads that you experience when you're playing soccer and running. And that's, um, with the foam rolling one, you don't roll the joint, you roll the muscle and the patellar tendonitis is typically the tendon that attaches to the patella. I've never actually tried to foam roll it before, so I don't know if you could Christo, I guess you probably tried. Well, the, uh, (laughs) the, the best, well, actually, you know, for patellar tendonitis, number one thing is strength training, do, do squats and deadlifts, um, and some other exercises, Nordics, calf raises, whatever. Um, but, uh, also something that actually is helpful is getting a patellar tendonitis strap. Uh, so under the, under the kneecap. Yeah. You basically, you can get these on Amazon and basically, I mean, you could do this with tape. So basically when you put your socks up to play, um, pull your sock over your knee and you just put a bit of tape right underneath your kneecap, nice and tight all around the knee. Compression. compression. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I use, I use knee sleeves when I squat for Mm -hmm. not exactly the same reason, but a similar reason. I, I started wearing them again because I got a little bit of knee pain one day and I put them on and they felt better. Yeah. And this actually does help. Um, like uh, I don't, it's not like if I'm sitting, I'm going to like wear a patellar tendonitis strap, but if I'm doing something active and I, and like pain gets in my way, um, I will, uh, I'll wear my patella tendon and strap. I actually do both. I tape it and then put the strap on top. Um, just because, um, sometimes if you're playing, like, uh, the strap can come a little bit loose yeah. uh, and it's nice to have the tape as well. Um, so that, that's what I do. Um, when I'm, when I'm playing, I don't usually the thing is I, I wear it for games. I don't usually wear it for, uh, don't have to wear it for training. Uh, it's just like, if, uh, if it starts hurting in a game, I don't want to have to like, do you wear it when you do resistance training or anything like that? No, because usually I don't get, I don't get pain, um, that much. Like I wore it religiously for like the first, uh, six months after I got it. Um, and then I like took it, I like had forgotten it someday and I like had a training session without it. And I was like, Oh, I feel fine. I guess I'll only wear it for games now, just in case I get a little bit of pain. Um, and then, and then I'll put it on. Yeah. And this is more compression than myofascial release. So it is a good, it's a good distinction between the two. Yeah. Has compression been proven to work in like studies like that? Like how, what's the physiological um, effect behind it? It's, it, it more has to do with 
that it just gives you a temporary pain relief at least um Christo might know more specific for a specific case but like what every single power lifter says about knee sleeves is this it gets my knees warm and makes me feel good to squat and obviously if you put a big cloth thing around your knees they're going to be warmer and <laughs> that will help you increase internal body temperature, be warmed up and feel good to squat. So like the small little aching. So it's not really about, I mean, the whole idea with knee sleeves and probably similar with his knee tendonitis band is it doesn't actually do much. It just does this little tiny little benefit that gets you to where you feel ready to perform. Honestly, I think like, uh, not so much with like compression. Like I've seen people wear, what are those like legs called? Like hydro, like or maybe it's not hydro. Like, have you seen people wear those like huge things on their legs that are supposed oh, to, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about that, yeah. that, oh, those things are, yeah. those are, those are BS. Like those yeah, do yeah. not work. No. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're definitely just overpriced. Yeah. Big, <laughs> you know, and it's booties. like, <laughs> yeah, like, um, the, like Every people, college like, soccer team does them though. <laughs> people take, take these things and like they run with them. So like someone will come out with a study that like wearing, um, compression, uh, like, uh, I don't know, sleeves on your like calves will reduce like copper fit. Calf, have yeah, you seen calf- the copper fit commercials? They, they, no. they're compression sleeves that have copper in them and copper oh, has a magic God. You, you see them on late oh, night, dude. like infomercials, <laughs> but like, you know, is it like someone like wearing compression sleeves on your calves reduces calf pain slightly. And people are like, Oh my goodness, let's compress our whole body. Um, <laughs> and all of a sudden you'll be able to play like you never have before. Um, and th- that's just not the case. Now, honestly, I think that the patella tendonitis strap, the reason that it works is probably because you strap it on. And it hurts a little bit if you put it tight, because if you put it loose, it doesn't really do anything, but if you put it tight, or if you tape around the bottom of your knee a little bit tight, it's like, what's that called? Like transferred pain. Like if you, if you're, if you're, um, hurting or something and you like, uh, pinch yourself, uh, you'll hurt. It's it's the trick where it's the trick where you fall over and scrape your knee, and your dad comes up to you, and pinches you on your yeah. cheek, and you go, "Ow, dad!" <laughs> and he goes, "Does <laughs> your knee hurt?" And it's like, "No, my face does." <laughs> yeah. So, like, honestly, I think it's is kind of something like that. Like, uh, and then you know, there are some benefits to compression. Like, knee sleeves can help a little bit. How much? Not too much, but they do. They do something. Yeah, and um, and, and the whole point is is we're not telling you, uh, you get to skip your resistance training and rehabilitation, all these really? things. Now just get knee sleeves. We're saying <laughs> you don't even need these necessarily, but they could help just a little bit. So yeah. I mean, if it's something that you can easily afford and easily have access to and want to yeah. try, but it's not a necessity, do the actual serious rehabilitations up first. So yeah. do we want to get into the things that work now. Yeah. I mean, like a patella tendonitis strap is like 10 bucks. Tape is like what? Like two, three bucks, like athletic yeah. tape. Like, you know, it, it's not uh, little pricey, stuff like this. The good ones, yeah, true. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to start by, by saying this, um, when people talk about like, uh, recovery, um, the 99% of your recovery is, like a handful of things that is sleeping, eating, taking care of your mental health. And then I will also say, so like taking care of like stresses in your everyday life. Um, and then resistance training is actually a form of recovery as well. And then the last thing I'll say is like active recovery. So like going for a walk, taking a bike ride, um, you know, like light exercise like this, even like playing a different sport, uh, on your, like, like the day after a game, just to like get moving in like different ways, that stuff, uh, does help a little bit. Um, but yeah, those, those like the five things I'd say. So sleep, food, um, active recovery, resistance training, and taking care of your, of yourself mentally. I'd, I'd say I largely agree with that. And the thing is, is sleep and food are probably the two most important well, and hydration, yeah, hydration yeah. and that. So sleep, 
athletes really should probably be aiming for eight to 10 hours a night, if at all possible. And if you don't, you're just not going to recover well enough and you're not going to have energy to perform as for food. We need high protein and also we need high carbs because athletes have to expend energy. You can't do low carb diet. If you want to be a soccer player, it just does not work. Um, and then hydration, we need lots of fluids and we need more than just water. We need our electrolytes, our salts and minerals and all that stuff. And really, I mean, recovery, the one problem with recovery is what works is boring. The things that work are the 100%, things, we, yeah. the things and they, that we, and like things time, we already time mentioned. Time consuming, right? And time, like, and, and time off. Yeah. I mean, really like the biggest things I do to recover is basically I don't do strenuous activity for a day. Mm -hmm. If I'm really trying to recover, I basically like, let's say if I had a really, really important game tomorrow, my activity for today might be going for a walk and it would be a short walk. It wouldn't even be a long walk. Yeah. And the reason is, is because your body needs time to recover because that's how it repairs and becomes strong again. And yeah. it's unfortunately, it's quite boring. And that's, I think that's why people like the idea of gimmicky fixes is because it's quicker and it gives you a more acute sense of something happening to where the reality is, is the only thing that really helps you is sleep, food, hydration, and time off. Yeah. The, like my advice to like any athlete would be like, stop doing everything that you're doing for recovery. Like e literally everything. And take all of that time and do a couple things. You could put it like all into sleeping more. If your sleep is shit, mm -hmm. you could put it like learn how to cook in that time so that you can cook yourself like simple, good meals. Um, or like put it like into like time that like you get real food rather than like, um, ordering, um, fast food all the time, which like, you know, you can, you can, I, like you don't need to have to be, like to be, strictest... to, be, to be fair. When I was playing professionally in Detroit, hot and ready little Caesars was our go-to meal for me and my roommate. <laughs> like no, and like you know, you can have uh, fast food. Your diet doesn't have to be a hundred percent clean. But like, I do think that uh, learning how to cook is uh, is for an sure, important sure. thing. And you don't, don't need to have to like learn how you don't to cook, have to like, be a good gourmet cook. meals. You, you need, yeah, you need to be able to have like three to five consistent yeah. meals that you can prepare halfway decent. Yeah, cooking complete. is not that hard. Like like basic stuff. At least pasta basic, yeah. and rice is not that hard. <laughs> Um, and some, and some like, uh, you know, throwing some protein on the, on a grill or on the stove or in the oven or, and some like vegetables in the oven. Like it really, like, seriously, like it is not that hard to do. Um, maybe I should do some cooking videos for, for athletes. Um, actually that would be something that would take off big, I think. Yeah. Like, cooking actually, videos are popular. So. And also you have the soccer niche. I don't think there is a soccer niche for cooking videos, only yeah. in bodybuilding and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like that, that stuff is, uh, or like if you're not doing any resistance training, you know, taking time for, to do two resistance training sessions a week, even if you're going to do them at home, um, that will, uh, that's better recovery than all the time you spend foam rolling, taking an ice bath or, you know, doing, doing whatever else, um, there is to do. And like sleep is a big one because sleep, like, yeah, I know it's hard to find, find the time to, to sleep, but like everyone in the world, well, ev like everyone should try to get seven hours of sleep. If you're getting yes. less than seven hours of sleep every 24 hours, like that is too little sleep. Sleep, like you don't have to do anything. You just have to like make the time to sleep. Yeah. Don't, don't leave Netflix closed one night. That's all <laughs> yeah. you have to do is like, don't open up Netflix. Um, but one other thing, cause you mentioned resistance training a lot, because I think you want to talk about resistance training. <laughs> I do have one alternative thing that can work for some people. Now it works really, really well for me because I have a home gym now. So people who have to drive to the gym, this is probably not ideal, but you don't actually have to do the two big workouts a week. You can do what I do and take what would be two to three big workouts a week and Split spread it up. across the week. So like a lot of times when I do my training I do session, too. I literally go down and do one exercise per movement that I'm doing. 
or one set. So like if I'm doing squats, I'll literally just do one set, one working set of squats. That'd be it. And I do the same thing for my upper body and my lower body pulling exercises. But when you spread that over seven days, that's more than enough volume to get the hypertrophy and strength adaptations that I need. But it's also really easy and it doesn't take too much time. And I find it more easy to do my strength training with that volume spread out across the week, opposed to like, for example, SK, you had a pretty hard leg day recently, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like (laughs) when you do a leg day, you do like probably three, four sets of squats, some sort of quadriceps accessory. Then you do your hip hinge exercise and then a few isolation hamstrings exercises. Now take that and do it over seven days instead of one day. And it might be a little easier, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's the way I that's the way I look at it. Because if I did if I did five hard sets of squats, I'm not sure I'd want a deadlift after is basically one of the things yeah. I'd say. And not only easier, but there are studies that show that like the benefits are bigger if you do that, if you split up your workouts, like frequency um helps with both strength and hypertrophy. Um and the reason is well, what like more enjoyable, so you'll you'll do it more. Um, if you can stay consistent, if you can do that, mm-hmm. you know, every day or like go from doing two, uh, times a week to four times a week or six times a week or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also the quality of your work is better. Yes. So, you know, if you do like three sets of squats, they'll probably be halfway decent sets. If you do six sets of squats, those last sets, they might yeah. look pretty ugly, like, you know, and, and you'll feel like, um, you know, yeah, the, the, the two biggest advantages to high frequency, it seems to be is that you get higher quality sets. So for example, if you did 10 sets of squats in a week and you did all those 10 sets on one day, you'll feel like the last five sets are just garbage. There's just nothing yeah. else to it. Yeah. However, if you spread that across the week, you're never doing more than two sets in a day. So you'll probably smash those sets, use heavier weights and you can take them longer even if you yeah. wanted to and do more reps. So you'll get more total volume. And it's actually just easier to get more total volume too, which is one of the advantages. Now, there is a hypothetical other advantage, and that's because protein synthesis spikes. However, there currently isn't evidence to support that this matters all that much. But if you know about protein synthesis spikes after resistance training, it tends to be about 48 hour up to 48 hours. So the idea being that if you train with higher frequency, you can keep those protein synthesis spikes permanently spiked basically. And this is even more true of more advanced athletes because those protein spikes only last about 12 to 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So for example, Christo, you and I might be considered advanced athletes in this case. Or well, no, your brother Demetrius. You're yeah, you're not, still an intermediate. I'm a, you're still I'm a intermediate. beginner. I'm a beginner. You're, I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, I've me never and Dimitri, kicked a soccer ball. Me and Demetri are <laughs> advanced on this one, but for us, it actually there at least is a reasonable scientific hypothetical as to why training more frequently might cause a slight increase, even if volume was equated because of the more frequent protein synthesis spikes. Yeah. So um, I have a question yeah, about that. So n- no, but how does your workout go? Is it just like you do three to seven exercises and then you're done for the day? Um, so basically what I'm currently doing is I start every session with a squat because I enjoy squatting. Now I wouldn't recommend everyone do this. I would recommend some people have a variety of lower body push exercises that they do more often, but I sometimes do a second exercise, but I start every session with a squat. And right now I'm alternating between an upper body push or an upper body pull. And then I do my hip hinge and hamstring training based on how terrible my hamstrings feel that day. And usually right now, because I've been playing a lot of soccer games, my hamstrings feel horrible. (laughs) So I don't train them very often, Mm -hmm. but yeah. So basically what I do is I do one to two sets of squats max Then for my upper body, because I'm alternating, I do three sets. And for my hamstrings, because my hamstrings are always sore, I tend to do one, maybe two sets, depending on how hard it is and how good I feel. Nice. Um, And uh, yeah, so obviously, uh, 
people are probably listening to this and being like, are you also arm like, training every single day? <laughs> True. <laughs> Always um, do my bicep. Back, back. And, 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 and be the, functional, the functional use in soccer is after you score, you get to do the celebration. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, I, uh, <laughs> is that your celebration? It's, it's one of my celebrations. <laughs> Biceps. Uh, <laughs> I know uh, Dama Traore does it too. Yeah, true. Ronaldo uh, always does the most muscular pose. Yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, people are probably listening to this and being like, um, "What? Why are they talking about resistance training when we're talking about recovery?" Um, but you know, for for me, it is. Um, and then uh, we touched on sleep, but I'll just give my like recommendation for athletes: is get a minimum of eight hours of uh, of sleep not time in your bed, sleep. Um, and then, um, if you're going, if you're sleeping more than 10 hours a day, that probably doesn't have benefits, but like going from eight hours to nine hours has been shown to have some benefits for athletes going from nine hours to 10 hours has been shown to have some benefits for athletes. So if you can get 10 hours of sleep, um, do that, uh, think, find a way, you know, it's, and realistically, I think if you're getting over 10 hours of sleep, it's usually because you're making up for lack of sleep previously. So for example, like I've had times to where like, I've gotten five hours of sleep an entire week and on weekends I sleep 14 hours, Yeah, but that's because I'm making up. I think if you're getting good sleep regularly, you'll probably wake up naturally after eight, nine hours, most of the time as is. Yeah. But w- one other thing I'd like to mention, because this is actually something that a lot of athletes do that is good and is work. And it is a way to get a little extra sleep. Nah. So have your sleep at night. And if you can find an hour during the day to take a nap, take a nap. I mean, find a dark s- spot that is comfortable and lie down and close your eyes for an hour or so. That's another way you can get a little more sleep and relaxation. And yes, that will help you recover. And it's, I mean, that can turn your seven hours a night sleep into eight hours a night eight hours, not during the night, but eight hours total. And that helps. Yeah. And like, Oh my God, I get so mad whenever I see like the habits of, prof- of successful people, Cristiano Ronaldo wakes up at 5. AM, you know, uh, whoever <laughs> the else, cult, the like- cult of waking up early is one of my <laughs> yeah. biggest pet peeves. Um, I Elon can't stand Musk the whole thing here. Wakes they up sleep at five hours 5 a night because yeah. they always work so hard. Yeah. And- but like, I, I, you can get your sleep whenever I get home from my coaching at like 10 o'clock at night, sometimes later. Um, I can't sleep at 10 o'clock, so I cannot wake up at 5.00 AM. Um, uh, like I'm usually eating dinner at, you know, 10, 30, 11. When I, like, when I get home, I used to have training 10 to 12. Yeah. And like, <laughs> you know, and lower, like, uh, teams like in, in England or, um, you know, lower level teams, it's often, you know, nighttime training. Like I saw, I saw, I don't know, even know how you say his name. So, so yeah, yeah. he, um, his team trains at night and he was like, he made a video about how it's, it's tough. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's probably less ideal for most people. Um, but you know, like if you can't get to bed and I often don't get to bed until like one or even like 2 AM because like I eat, um, and I have, you know, some, some downtime that I don't usually have during the day I sleep in, I wake up at, you know, if I go to bed at one, I'm not waking up before nine, Like I'm not sorry. Like, and if, if you think that makes me like lazy or something like, you know, what, yeah. whatever, like, who yeah. Cares? Um, and here's the thing, like s- some people, if you have work at seven or eight, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Um, that that's just the unfortunate reality of living in the world as it is i we get too much into economics and politics for that krista we'll do an episode on that one day <laughs> yeah. economics and soccer um but the fact of the matter is is yeah there's a entire cult of waking up early and we used in high school we had death at dawn was when we did our conditioning we'd go run on a track at 6 a.m in the morning before class in the morning and we didn't have practice in the afternoons I remember I asked coach one day, is like, why don't we just do this in the afternoon after school? Because we're all here anyways, and there's no nothing else for us to do. Yeah. He's like, because you have to sacrifice. And I'm like, yeah, sacrifice my sleep so I do terrible in school and I perform worse at sports. Great. 
Yeah, it's like that's that's the the kind of mentality, uh, and that that's actually yeah. uh, good to like um, move into like you know taking care of your of your mental health kind of like. And I'm not even like obviously I I talk about like stuff like meditation and self talk and um, all of this stuff, but like the most important thing for like taking care of your mental health, at least I found, is like um, talking to your friends and your family. All right. Being yeah. like, you know, having a social life, um, you know, like uh, spending time with the, with the, the people that you love. Like, obviously, you know, if you're a very serious athlete, you do need to make some sacrifices. Um, but like athletes who are like, oh, I, you know, I have no time for a social life. I have no time for my girlfriend or my wife. I have no time for my family. Other hobbies, I, yeah, too. you know, I think that's yeah, exactly. Like, I think that's the I think that's the wrong approach, and I think long term that's going to hurt your you as a person and as an athlete. Yeah, like for sure. the ath- athletes who prefer, like Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi, like yes, they work extremely hard. They also have families, um, yeah. and you know, like it's it's pretty apparent to me that they are, um, you know, uh, in like engaged as like. Uh, in their family life, you know, they're yeah. part of it. They're not just like, um, obviously like it's like any, um, Busy you know, any person who, yeah, still. exactly. Has, has a job, like a full-time job and stuff. And obviously they work very, very hard, but they make time for their family and their kids and time to relax and spend their time doing things that they, uh, that they enjoy doing. Obviously they enjoy playing soccer. So that's like the, the, you know, it's good to have a job you enjoy, but at the same time, like things you enjoy and the people that you love. And you yeah, also sure. see, and, um, sorry, you can go ahead. Okay, no, I'll go that's ahead. Okay. Um, something I want to remind everyone is like for everything, for mental health, for the recovery, uh, how you recover, it's kind of, you have to find what works for you. And I'm not saying like don't sleep because it doesn't work for you. Those are necessary, like sleep, <laughs> hydration. I eat no food because I can't find foods I like. <laughs> yeah. So I heard like Ronaldo takes like five out, like five naps or like three hours each. And that's how he does his sleep schedule and it obviously works for him. So in all of these, I would say do what works for you. So like maybe for your mental health, you like watching Netflix alone, you like talking to your friends, or maybe you don't like doing ice baths, so you don't do them. So like kind of finding that balance of what works for you, I think is very beneficial for recovery. Yes. Um, and that actually helps me into what I was going to say anyways. Um, Cause I was going to mention how there's actually quite a few professional athletes that are also musicians. They play an instrument, all these things. And what that basically does is gives them a stress relief from their sport and allows them to channel some energy into something else, which takes their mind off it. And there you go. That's a form of mental training. If you like playing the guitar, you like rapping or any of these things. Yeah. Take a few hours I'm, and focus on I'm dropping on that. my album in a couple of weeks. Don't worry. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. My old coach was a rapper actually for Detroit Waza. I'll have to send you his songs. They're actually really fun, but yeah, like, so have, have some hobbies that aren't, just soccer i mean get into movies read books actually reading books is something you should do read kids you'll learn a lot i i know i know probably probably all three of us don't read as much as we should even and Friso and i probably read more than most people um but. my uh it was actually it was actually funny because when i was a kid i used to uh listen to books on tape to fall asleep well, my, like my parents would always read to me when I was very, very little. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, yeah. Uh, like when they had less too old time. To- yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, you know, I was just like, I don't want my mom to read, but, but like, I still wanted to like listen to a book and I used to listen to books on tape all the time. Um, and then, um, I, uh, not like super recently, but I got back into listening to a lot of audiobooks in the last, like probably three, four years. Um, and I hadn't for, for a little bit. Um, and, um, some, and it was because someone said something to me, um, they had a new year's resolution that they were going to read a book a month, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 
I was like, I asked them like, oh, how's it going? And they were like, oh, it's, it's going great. I'm actually, lis- I'm actually listening to more than one book a month. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> listening to, I thought you said you were going to read. And he's like, what's the difference? And I was like, hmm, fair yeah. enough. And yeah, I um, listen to audiobooks every day yeah, on my, on my drives to work. And I'm in the car usually for multiple hours a day, uh, driving to and from sessions. Um, and I'm listening to, uh, yeah, it's a very convenient yeah, way to do it. Books. Yeah. And it's I used like, to do that with a review of books that I've read before. I listen to the audio tape cause it's much quicker in the audio tape. And yeah, you, if you I've already read it before, I can while doing it, right. You can like work out and go walk your dog. Yeah. yeah. Now Drive. there is, there, there is, there is one drawback <laughs> I've noticed is if it's a book I really want to retain the information in, audiobooks are normally the worst possible thing. Yes. Um, I actually need to sit down and read it. But with books, for example, that I've read before, I can typically just listen to the audio tape and, oh, I remember everything I've already read. And that's, that's the way I've reread a few books. Yeah, I listen to... Um... For like just to when I'm just like looking to chill, I listen to uh, fantasy books usually that I read as a kid. So it's uh, Harry Potter, Percy Jackson. Um, I've just I'm finishing up Gregor the Overlander uh, that series. Uh, it's a couple a uh, couple more uh, fantasy books like that, which are like you know they're they're kids books, but um, you know it's. Uh, it's super nostalgic stuff for me. Yeah, uh, so that's very that's enjoyable. that's probably my big problem with reading is I read almost exclusively hard materials, histories, philosophy, economics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not Middle as Eastern fun as con- me. Middle Eastern conflict. <laughs> okay, nice. I listen to the podcast to relax myself. This one <laughs> on Spotify. <laughs> yeah, this one. Yeah. Podcasts are good. <laughs> yeah, there's another one called the uh, the football sideline. Uh, oh yeah, no, I think that one's the best one. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> I think I think they're tied. Yeah. Um, uh, I uh, oh, I forgot what I was gonna say. Go go ahead. <laughs> anything uh, anything else we want to uh, to touch on? Um, only because we for kind of skipped over stretching. Mm-hmm. Um, the only things I want to say about stretching is. Stretching is probably what most people think is like one of the best things you can do for your body. Mm -hmm. And when I mean stretching, I mean static stretching in particular, like bending over and touching your toes, those type of things. So my big thing with stretching is this. What most of the research shows is that it provides no benefit before physical activity. And there's a very small amount of research showing that it can actually be detrimental to performance and especially weightlifting or sprinting activities, but this is acute and it goes away after 10 to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But so for warming up, what my recommendations are is you warm up, start doing what you're going to do and start slowly and then increase the mobility demands that you need for your sport and then work up for it. So if that's soccer pass with a teammate, and not moving very much, then start passing with a teammate and moving, then eventually get into something like a keep away game or something like that. If it's lifting weights, what you'll do is, is you'll do maybe some very short dynamic mobility stuff, some body weight squats, and then you'll put the bar on your back and you'll start with lightweight squats. And that's how you'll warm up. Now for post game stretching, it's one of those things. It's not going to you. help you, not going to hurt you. It's up to you. Um, it might be mostly placebo, but it's not the worst thing in the world. So I'm not going to tell someone not to yeah. do it, but I'm also probably not going to advise them to do it. Yeah. And like when I was uh, kind of, when I started uh, reading some, some research on stretching and realized it was horrible, obviously I'd like, um, or not horrible, but like it was, it is horrible um, in my opinion. Uh, I yeah. never before, do it. before, uh, before exercise that it had some like, uh, you know, that it could hurt your performance if you did it before um, I started. Um, and obviously, you know, for my whole life, we had done static stretching before yeah. every practice, before every game. Um, and we were still doing it. And I was like, I want to like, yeah. Be like, let's not do this. But instead I was, um, what I would do is I would just make static stretches into dynamic stretches. So, you know, like bend down, like touch your toes, like bend down, touch your toes and stand back up 
you're 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 better than me at this i would just kind of like stand there and be awkward (laughs) (laughs) yeah well i i you know the team comes first noble and i i don't want to make my teammates feel bad i don't want to make my coach feel bad yeah but half the Uh, (laughs) team wasn't ever actually really doing the stretching were they i mean true but like the difference uh, is is the difference is, is they were being lazy and I was being scientifically True. smart about it. But, but I like <laughs> at the same time, like, you know, you're not going to like, I'm not going to stand there and like juggle the ball while my teammates are stretching. Yeah. Yeah. So like I could stand there and do nothing or I could make those uh, static stretches into dynamic stretches, which I think dynamic stretches have their have their place. Uh, I think, you know, just using a ball, uh, usually even my technical warmups incorporate a soccer ball, but like, you know, uh, if if people want to do like open the gate, close the gate, heels, knees, yeah. all of that stuff, well, like open that's the gate, fine. close the gate's actually good. That's actually what yeah. I do as part of my yeah. squat warm up for GCU. yeah, not very long, but that's yeah. what I do. Yeah, so like I would just make static uh, stretches into dynamic stretches, um, and it's pretty easy to do that. You know, if you're doing like like I said, like touch your toes, stand up, touch your toes, and then you're you're basically just doing like a Romanian deadlift at that point with body weight, which is super easy. But like, if you're working on your mobility a little bit, like and resistance training has been shown to actually be as good or better for mobility than static stretching ever will be. So if you're actually getting your stretching by doing resistance training, if you're doing it properly for through a full range of motion, none of these quarter squatting stuff. Yeah. (laughs) All right. I think we've, uh, we've, Hit we this one it. pretty, uh, pretty show, well. Show off your mystique jerseys real quick, then. To, yeah, to I'm gonna, that. I'm gonna do a shout out in a second. But yeah, I mean, obviously, recovery is a huge topic, so we'll probably touch on it again, like most of the topics we talk about, um, because they are so, you know, kind of broad. And I'm sure there are things we've missed that will, uh, I'll be, I'll be thinking back on this podcast in five minutes. I'll be like, should have said that. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, everyone, all set. Yeah. yeah, I'm good. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So I'll do quick shout outs. So right now there's a giveaway going on on my TikTok uh, for a Mystique uh, jersey. Actually, by the time this is on YouTube, it'll probably be over. Um, but I'll probably um, I'll do a post uh, talk, uh, you know, announcing the winner um, and uh, giving everyone who you know participated um, uh, a little discount. So if you want to get your, your mystique Jersey, uh, your mystery Jersey, uh, you can, you can do that and probably get like 10% off, um, and su- support, you know, uh, our, our social media. And, uh, but yeah, this, I got this Dortmund Jersey pretty sweet. Um, I've been wearing it, uh, a lot. <laughs> um, other shout out, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you want to watch it a couple days early, you can sub to me on Patreon. Um, and you'll, uh, you'll get it, uh, two days early. Uh, if you just can't wait, uh, for all the knowledge we're dropping, um, uh, watch, our, have... watch our new episodes early on yeah, Patreon yeah. because if they're watching you tell us to watch this episode, they've already seen it. Oh, true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I always, I always watch new that. episodes yeah. weekly or bi-weekly on Patreon. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's also, um, I got to get you guys some, uh, some merch and I'm going to do some, some giveaways for my merch. Yeah, I've got to get you uh, my old merchandise that I've made a long time ago. All right. Nice. We'll have to exchange. <laughs> yeah. Exchange one. Um, no, but it really needs a shirt. So if someone wants to buy him uh, <laughs> an improving, always, uh, you know, shirt, uh, and get it to him, you know, he, I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Cause, um, or a mystique Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Or that, um, but yeah, uh, and obviously, you know, you should follow, you should be following all three of us um, on, uh, on social media. I'll put the, uh, you know, I'll put our TikTok pages down below. We also all have Instagram pages um, and uh, yeah, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. Um, hope that you uh, have, uh, you know, benefited from, uh, from the, I, I think this is actually one that like will help a lot of. Uh, young players if they if they take this advice because i know from personal experience that my recovery uh, i had a lot of bad ideas about what recovery was Mm -hmm. when i was younger um you know i i wasn't always the uh the intelligent uh man that i am now Um, you weren't you weren't (laughs) always like me (laughs) yeah i mean (laughs) i mean i talked about my my story is doing acupuncture on my knee and like all this stuff so you know like yeah I was, I was clueless. Um, and, 
you know, in a similar theme to a lot of my stuff, like this is, this is stuff that I wish I had known. It's a learning uh, experience. Yes. You know, this is stuff that I wish I had known when I was, uh, when I was younger. Uh, that's why I started posting on social media to help people who were in the position I was in and recovery is, is huge. Uh, it's just not huge in the way that you think it is usually. Yeah. All right. Water bottles empty. And that's the podcast. Adios.